welcome back to another episode of the Tuck Cast with a splash of bourbon. We are back from the big city of Cincinnati, thank goodness. Nothing bad up there, just tired of driving. So I uh, got Shannon here and Dale here with me. And uh, good to be back, even though it's raining, it's good to be back. Smaller splash of bourbon this time. Smaller splash of bourbon. There you go. Things got carried away last week. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I didn't Thanks, so. Brandon. <laughs> All the mics smell like bourbon. <laughs> what is up with that? Oh, man, it was a great time in Cincinnati, though. Uh, those, those Buckeye guys, they, uh, it's a one-day show. You, you get there on Friday to set up. They help you unload, at least from our perspective. Uh, unload your stuff and you get to your booth. And uh, the show attendance is, is good. And everybody's just real friendly. And, you know, you see it. You engage a lot of people that we see here in the shop season over season. And, uh, just, just a really positive environment. Uh, so nothing but good things to say about it. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, you know, uh, you guys were saying that your presentation was was standing room only um, there for that. What I think you had an hour um, yeah. there of that, so. and that was following Gary Borger. So yeah, I mean that's kind of a. I mean to me that's a big name, and you know I, I kind of suspected that when he finished, a lot of folks would go back into the to the show hall. Uh, but a lot of folks stayed and um, man, took a nap. I did. <laughs> there were a couple guys sitting up front. I'm like, this dude just wants a break. <laughs> He's tired He's, of walking. And and he had that neck locked. I mean, he 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 just was. Like, when they walk in with those little airplane cushions around their neck, you know they're <laughs> they're not there to listen to you. This is Hazel Creek. <laughs> oh Lord, the man. largest watershed of the park. Oh mercy! No, it was awesome. Your your fly tying demonstration was was. I stuck my head in there a couple of times. And it was it was good, man. You with me? You with me? You with me? That's it was right. good. I, I will. If you're in one of my presentations, you will be engaged in the conversation. I, I, it's the way I like to do things. I want it to be an open line of communication instead of me talking. And uh, you know, I like the feedback with people, engaging people, because it, if if they're focused on what's going on or they're a part of it. You know, they have something that maybe they can take away from it or maybe contribute to it um, there. But uh, but it was fun. The setup was nice, very professionally done, uh, you know, with the camera on the big screen there, um, everything ready to go. Some really good questions. Um, already got an email or two back from my presentation of people, uh, you know, asking about writing a book or encouraging me to write a book about fly patterns. And so we did get that. Of Shane was going to be an author. It's, uh, yeah. Who's alert? Author of pain, I guess. I don't know, man. It'd be a pretty ugly. What's but, his, uh, he's going to hand draw the flies. But the amount of people that came by the booth was just astronomical. It, it was tremendous. It was all right. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. It was, it was really good. Yeah. We, we didn't sit down. It's amazing how bad I am with names. Everybody's like, hey, Bobby. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. But hey, <laughs> I'll tell you, <laughs> I feel a, bad about a it. A cool moment I, I, I really enjoyed was, um, one of our customers, uh, VK, that we see, you know, pretty pretty regularly. He and his son were there, and his son was in his Cub Scout gear, and uh, they didn't have enough uh, Cub Scouts sign up for the fly tying, or not fly tying, but the fly fishing badge class. And I was like, well, "What do you need to do?" And he's like, "He just needs to work on some knots." So we sat there in the booth, and uh, you know, just kind of let the world go by around us. And the kid ate like eight brownies. He did. <laughs> Dude, he, he was stuck on one it. in one time. I thought he put a put a big. Uh, uh, water red man in his <laughs> cheek, man. <laughs> Beach nut. But he did. He, you know, I guess he'd been observing Jack throughout the day. Maybe, yeah, you know, said, so yeah. Jack said, Let's was, eat a brownie. Jack was throwing down on those brownies too. But yeah, that's, that was, uh, I think we had actually just got back from the, from the fly tying segment. Then yep. he was sitting there yeah. at, at the tying desk that I had there. And, uh, which is awesome, man. That, that's, um, some of those things where all of us can have an input on people, regardless of our skill sets and stuff uh, you know sitting down with a scout like that and helping them and engaging them so that, that's that's pretty cool man yeah we have to throw a shout out to jack's parents too man and his step parents man they are always so nice to us his mom brought the brownies and cookies and uh, his dad took us out for dinner and good times so well and that's that's one thing we enjoy about these shows probably probably the most is is being able to go do different you know in richmond we went to dc this time Shannon got to see a buddy that he hadn't seen since 1993, y'all. Yeah, man. That's it. You yeah, know, let's talk about food and you, recreation. You know, 93, man, music was a lot different back in the day. Oh, yeah. You know. Well, and, and, and we, we went and hit Top Golf. Yeah, you, top got, golf. you guys went and hit Top Golf. We went to. And my arms and legs and back still hurt. <laughs> yeah. 
I guess. And I discovered I can hit a three wood off the deck farther than a driver. There you go. With don't a microchip over, golf ball. Don't overswing. It's the key. Man. Oh, there wasn't no overswing, and I wouldn't no. be walking. <laughs> <laughs> fall what, off that platform yeah, what, what concert did you go to so we went uh so so dave and his his oldest son troy that i met for the first time uh he's 24 um met him and um we went to the brantley gilbert uh, concert down in northern kentucky university and um the cool thing about that is that uh, uh those tickets were donated to veterans um, so nice. with, with both of us serving in the military, we have access to those and David procured those for us, um, there. So, so that was, that was kind of cool. It was, it was a good show, entertaining show. Uh, I kind of felt like we went to what we thought was a country country show that turned into a rock concert, but it really showed their versatility and a lot of things they could do, which is fine for me. You know, I grew up in the era with a lot of the, you know, you know, the rock and the hair bands and things like that. So, uh, so that, that was pretty fun. So we went there. You know, shared some stories, some good old laughs and things like that. And uh, I think I got back and you guys are like, man, we we're worried about you. <laughs> we I mean, didn't we, know this we guy. We didn't know this guy, man. You ain't seen him you, since 1993. He's 27 he years. He could have done hard timing by then. <laughs> yeah. no, Just he, got out of prison. He could have served a life sentence of 25 years by the time <laughs> you saw him again. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Mom and Dad. Thank we you. were like, we hope we don't find Shannon in the Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Grab onto the barge, Shannon. <laughs> 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 no, it it was it was good. It it was a good time, but uh you know the the drive up, you know, to the Ohio area, we got to stop off in Lexington at a place called Drake's for lunch. Oh yeah. Drake's it was good. Drake's man. was good. Yeah, if you're traveling seventy five, stop at Drake's in Lexington. Smash burger. It is good. It's good. And the edamame. However you say that. Yeah, that stuff's good. The edamame appetizer. Thanks, Ellis. Those beans. That's right. Shout out to Ellis for, for taking us to lunch, man. That was awesome. Man, there wasn't enough of those beans. Yeah, those were good. They they go fast. How do you say it again? Ed a uh, mame. Ed a uh, mame. That's like Amadou. Ah, I threw it into the episode. Amadou. Oh, there we Amadou go. Patch. Amadou. It's in there. Amadou. Um, I had the, 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 the mame sliders. Flash. Yeah. And I thought I mean, the meat was fantastic. It was just, I don't know what they do as far as their, their content, as far as how they mix their meat. Probably the, ground beef and salt. Why do they call them sliders? Uh, you know, we had sliders on the ship, actually. They called, <laughs> I had never heard slider <laughs> until I got to the ship. And I was Were like, they as good as Drake's? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Mystery meat. No. Nor, nor was what it. What did the Navy do to their burgers? That's what we really want to know. Shh, calm down. Let's not go in there. They keep them months on end without going to port. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Ooh, Lord help us. Oh yeah. But uh, but your man, your smash burger was like what what five six inches tall. Well, it yeah. That, pretty, like, the big. lettuce filler I took out the yeah. tomato. That's all filler. So I it was removed. only four inches tall then. That's right. Yeah. And Bobby had the. I just had a regular old burger. It yeah. was good though. Yeah. It was it was it was good it wasn't stuff. Nothing super special. I would get they had tots. They had tots. Oh yeah, tots. You going to eat your tots? We we took Shannon to Chewy's. If if any of y'all ever been to Chewy's, he'd never been. So that was a got him some jalapeno ranch. Yeah, which is always well, I, tasty. I think the highlight of that night was Duluth Trading Company. Yeah, oh my gosh, being able to walk around one of those the factory things. store of Duluth Trading that was Duluth. that's like man heaven, man. It was so watch it. Yeah, so let me say this: when you go to a Duluth, if if you find one, go into it. They had the most comfortable chairs. At least in this one, in the back with the TV and stuff back there, but uh, but you know the products that they have in that store, very realistic. I say sizing, um, very. I thought it was you know stuff fit me. It was it's fair, awesome. They, yeah, it was it's fair like clothes for people that like Oreos. It's uh, it was <laughs> everything seemed to be fairly <laughs> priced, um, easy to go get carried away in there with emotional purchases. But uh, you know the staff at that at that store. We, we basically were kept making laps and like, hey, man, check this out. Look at this. Look at this. Along about 830, the gentleman comes up to us because, is there anything we can help you with there? Uh, we closed at 8, and we're still there at like 830, and they had not kicked us out. Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were nice. Yeah, maybe they should have engaged us a little sooner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Here's a customer service tip, folks. Don't wait an hour and a half to talk to somebody in your store. <laughs> maybe it's called overtime. Maybe we're like, yeah, we're going to hit that mark. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. Economy's good. We're going to hit that mark. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Who knows, man? Well, those are good times, man. I'm glad we got to do that. Um, anything else we want to talk about before we go into the interview? Are you going to do a quick fishing report? Just, uh, yeah, man. Some folks? 
Let's do a fishing report. Well, uh, you know, we we over the weekend here, Duke Energy kind of uh, kind of dropped their generation off, and we had a, a couple guys come to the shop, and they sent us a message on Facebook, and uh, they said they they netted about forty five fish over there on the uh, Webster delayed harvest section of the Tuckasegee. So uh, the upper Nantahala is is, is kind of out of question, creating the lower Nantahala to be out of question because they're just spilling water over the top of the dam until well, I guess Friday. And then they'll go back to normal operation, but it it really does mess up that delayed harvest. They kind of sometimes do that this time every of year, year, every yeah. January. They, they usually January into February. Yeah, yeah, if you've ever been up there and seen that one hill by the powerhouse, it's just covered in ice. It's because they've blown the pipe out, and uh, it's like a little winter wonderland there out of nowhere. Yeah, I think they're always they go through and check that entire pipe. Yep, which is that's got to be a cool job. But we've had some had some. Uh, Really good weather here and there in between the, the rain systems. Uh, we got a big one coming through now that's going to drop some rain. But yesterday, Monday, it was uh, 70 degrees. So had some really good hatches and uh, really good fishing reports from, from everybody coming in the shop. So, you know, when you find these days in February, you just got to just gotta hit it. You know, don't, don't, don't let the weather forecast keep you in your recliner. You, you just got to get out of the house and go do it. So uh, we do have a question this week uh, from Dennis. Uh, his question is, how do we know um, about tuck flows and, and, and when the water is going to come from the dam? That's a, that's a great question, and uh, one sometimes we don't always know the answer to. Right, Shannon? That's, that's, you know, we are just like anybody else out there. We have to look at, uh, you know, resources. And fortunately on our website, we've tried to take the, uh, make it simple for you. If you go to uh, tuckflyshop.com, we have a link there for stream, you know, stream flow information and uh, release schedule information. So we look at the same data that you look at. Uh, we may do it more periodically because this is what uh, you know we do on a regular basis. But we, we look at that information. The one tidbit that I would give you that might help you there, Dennis, is actually if you look at the stream flows, uh, what Duke Energy is doing, uh, after you select Nantahala, it's going to give you East Fork, a West Fork, and also Nantahala. Uh, the east and the west fork of your Tuckasegee River flows, and of course, Nantahala is pretty self-explanatory. But there's a paragraph up above it that says check lake levels. If you will click on that check lake levels link, and then once again select Nantahala, it's going to give you a chart of all the lakes, target, um, you know, uh, depths that they want on the lake. And uh, over to the right-hand side, it says there's a list that says messages. If there's ever a date uh, under that message link, you need to click on it. So, for instance, like right now, I think there's one that's dated 131 of 20 for the Cedar Cliff Lake. So, if you click on that, it's going to open up uh, a message from Duke Energy, which is in red, that will tell you about, you know, maintenance that they have going on. You know, that gate's always going to be open right now as they're maintaining those levels. Basically, the water's just running through there so they can do the work that's required by um, the regulatory commission to, to do some updates up there. Uh, so, if we get a lot of rain... On that particular page they'll update that so click always click on that um, that date on that message side there and if there's a warning it will be listed there in red uh, it's one of those little hidden features that you don't know about but legally they have posted that information and uh, that's how I personally try to keep up with what's going on maybe above and beyond what's yeah. what's listed there and uh, well and we only we only see three days out what what they're gonna do I mean, so we, we, we only see a small window that Duke's going to give us. it changes. It does. Yeah. They can change. They, they reserve the right. It says an asterisk there. They reserve the right to do what they need to do. Um, and you just have to just have to accept that. So, uh, yeah. So, Dennis, check out the website. Um, check out the Duke Energy site with um, the uh, the flows there, and you, you'll see a three-day three day outlook. So that's, that's, the, that's the best we can do. So unfortunately but uh if any of you out there have a question and you come in the shop it's a lot easier to show you we can pull it up absolutely on the computer and go through it a little quicker well and on you. the website it's uh <clears throat> what's the button on the website generation and stream or uh re- stream release, flows and releases yeah releases and stream flows yeah. something like that yeah so, so check that out and uh hey if you got other questions guys send them in uh, info at tuck fly shop and uh keep them coming great question guys We are back here with our good buddy, King Castorf from Endless River Adventures. He has uh, lived here since about 1975 in Western North Carolina and then in the area of Bryson City, the Nantahala Gorge. Um, Been fishing here since then. So he's got a lot of experience with the waters around here. So we're super excited to talk to him today. 
and uh, find out a little bit more about what he does as a fisherman, as a guide, and also he owns a rafting company. So that'll be kind of cool to hear that side of things too. Um, so Ken, man, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Happy to happy to have you, man. So um, we always started out with, you know, where'd you grow up? Because obviously you didn't come here until the 70s, so you uh, you didn't grow up here. Where did you where'd you grow up? Well, actually, I was born in Austria and then came to the United States when I was four years old. And then, really? Yeah, and then grew up in uh, in a little place called Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, which is right on. Fond du Lac is a French word that uh, or French phrase that means foot of the lake. So it was right on the uh, shores of Lake Winnebago in Wisconsin. Fondo, isn't that when you dip the stuff? Fondo <laughs> Lac. Exactly. <laughs> so a little follow up on that. Why were uh, why were your parents in Austria? Like, how'd that? Uh, my dad met my mom over there during uh, World War II. Seriously, mm-hmm. that is cool. Man. That's one thing I didn't know about you. So yeah. that's that's pretty cool, man. I'm see, you learn something every day. There you that's, go. That's cool. <laughs> so, what brought you to to Western North Carolina in 1975? You know, my uh, my. Uh, parents all the way from my great grandfather to my dad were all block brick and stone masons and uh, I uh, started kayaking and I figured out that kayaking was a whole heck of a lot more fun than laying block so yeah. <laughs> I heard about a place down here that uh, was teaching kayaking I was teaching kayaking up in Wisconsin at that point in time and uh, decided that it was time for a little bit of a change my granddad had retired and uh, my dad didn't want to continue with the uh, company and and I knew that my granddad and I would kill each other if I did it, so I, I decided it was time to go for a little uh, vacation south and try to figure out what I was going to do the rest of my life, which I'm still trying to figure that out now. <laughs> <laughs> that happens in this town. It does, man. It does. So before um, coming to Western North Carolina, you, you, you were basically a stonemason? Is that- yeah, yeah. I, I graduated from high school. I actually uh, got accepted at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I was going to go into, of all things, paleontology. And uh, that's, that's yeah, yeah, you're finding, up, finding out yeah. all sorts of crazy yeah. stuff, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a fossil hunter. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, that didn't work out because of money, the stuff. So I took up. Yeah, they the, don't make too much money. No, no, <laughs> yeah. I took up the trade and uh, started uh, building houses and, and uh, it went from there. And, and then I, I sort of went astray on this kayaking thing. And my granddad, my granddad was, uh, and my dad both were avid fishermen. In fact, my, yeah. grand, my granddad, fishing was not a sport. It was an endeavor. So, you know, there was one way of doing it, and that was grandpa's way. So Yeah, that, that actually kind of <laughs> leads us into the next question. I mean, is he the one that got you into fishing? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I think I was more the motor than the fisherman because I rode him about around <laughs> in just about every lake in northern Wisconsin, which is how I learned how to row a boat. That's very neat. Did was it all gear or was some of it fly fish? Like, did you fly fish in Wisconsin? Or? You know, we never fly fished in Wisconsin. Uh, fly fishing, there was a little bit of it going on back in in that day. You have to remember that this is just a little bit up from the Stone Age. So, he, uh, you know, he was definitely, you know, uh, spin fisherman, casting rod. We used to we we fished a lot of uh, water up in northern wisconsin for muskie and northern pike and walleye that sort of stuff yeah they still have plenty of that yes they do i wish i could go back there right now with uh, about a 10 weight rod and uh yeah it's cold yeah it's cold right now (laughs) yeah right right now right now you need about a two about a two foot rod and (laughs) and an ice chisel (laughs) yeah I've never fished in the kind of that upper Midwest section, so that'd be fun to go. Good smallmouth fishing up there. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's some really good smallmouth fishing in that area too. And you know, I mean, there's everything. I mean, you got perch and and bluegills, you know, panfish, crappie, everything. Yeah, that's cool. Crappie or crappie, crappie, however you crappie say or it. crappie. <laughs> it's like bluegill or brim, right? It's exactly. Like, we call them crappie. Crappie. Yeah. Crappie. Yeah. Crappie. Crappie. They yeah. supposedly taste good though. They don't taste crappy. No, <laughs> Uncle Ronnie calls them crappy, crappy, <laughs> crappy on Norris. Go get some crappy. So um, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, you you guide for fly fishing. We we know that. Um, so everybody out there now knows that. But when did you start doing that? Also, um, what are some of the things that Endless River Adventures does besides fly fishing and rafting? Kind of go through. You know, give yourself a plug, I guess, is, is the best way to do it. <laughs> All right. I'll try. <laughs> you know, uh, I started actually guiding uh, for the fly fishing about 25 years ago. Okay. And um, 
I, I went to uh, Northern California in 1987 and guided steelhead fishing and on the Klamath River. And that's where I learned how to row a drift boat, and that's what really got me more and more into the, the guiding um, uh, endeavor. Came back here, built a drift boat, continued on with it, and, and you know, here we are. I worked for uh, another company in Nantahala Gorge for 25 years, or 20 years actually, as their head kayak instructor. And then, you know, just decided that I wanted to, wanted to start something that was a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to keep uh, quality control and, you know, and uh, be able to give that customer service uh, a little bit more effort. Yeah. And uh, so we started Endless River Adventures, and right now Endless River Adventures does rafting on three different rivers. We're still really well renowned for the kayak instruction. Um, we uh, we also do some lake touring things like that. And then uh, during the winter time here, when uh, when the fishing starts getting good here, <laughs> we uh, we actually send a crew off to Ecuador. We have a lodge there in the Amazon, and. They uh, they do kayaking trips and rafting trips there. What's and, what's the name of that? And uh, the uh, the name of the lodge is the Rio Quijos Eco Lodge. That's fun to say. Yeah, they just it had, is. <laughs> didn't they just have one of the volcanoes or something erupted away? Oh yeah, not too far away. Yeah, but you know I always joke. You know our lodge is situated about forty kilometers from an active volcano, so I'm one of those few people that I can claim that I have my own volcano. That's awesome. <laughs> that is That's cool, pretty man. cool, man. It is. Yeah, it's, it's cool until it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, every every now and then, you know, driving down on our uh, entry, you know, on the driveway going into the lodge, it's about a kilometer off of the main highway and you can look down valley and see the smoke coming out of the volcano yeah wow an interesting thing that just happened uh just a few days ago actually there's a waterfall there that's a 500 foot waterfall called san rafael falls and the whole back part of the waterfall collapsed i, was, and, I saw that on yeah yeah I think, I think they posted that on facebook yeah, yeah the whole back part of the waterfall collapsed where the water used to fall over the falls is completely gone and there's a tunnel now that's developed under the falls where all of the water is coming out. Yeah, so, I saw those pictures. You know, that was that's kind of crazy. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it is. At that area there, it's you know, Nat you, Geo. Oh yeah, that area there, you could be walking around, see a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and go, oh look, there's a Tyrannosaurus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny, man. That's funny. So you mentioned that y'all do three rivers. What are the three rivers? Uh, the Nantahala, the Ocoee, and then the Chiowa. Okay. Okay. And then you know, in Ecuador too, what we're doing <clears throat> now, I you know. Uh, naturally the natural progression was you know go from kayaking to fishing in any way form of, uh, that's possible so it took uh, a number of years to figure out where I could find Golden Dorado and Handia in Ecuador and finally found those we finally figured out that you can't ask the locals what where Golden Dorado are because they don't call them that <laughs> what, call, what do they call them they call them wallow so wallow wallow, wallow is the Quechua or the Inca language that's the word for uh, Golden Wallow. Dorado. Wallow. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as I asked. I'm learning a ton of stuff. As soon as I asked for Wallow, they're going, oh, yeah, we got those right here, you know. And prior to that, I'd ask, well, you have any Golden Dorado? What's that? <laughs> I guess Golden Dorado sells a little better than Wallow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just just in the marketing aspect of it. We're going to go yeah. Wallow fishing. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Wallow, yeah. man. That's... Wallow is kind of like where you think you might go fishing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like those. those Mountain dialect. I'm gonna go wallow over here in the mud. Yeah, or there you pigs go. wallering. That's it. <laughs> so um, we always ask this to just about everybody. Two memories of of fly fishing. Uh, one, your personal favorite memory, and then also your your favorite memory when you were actually guiding a client. You know, you know, I'm gonna combine those. Okay. Um, because it really, it really was pretty much the same thing. I didn't have my hand on the rod, but you know, I was out there fly fishing with a, a friend of mine and I was guiding him. And um, this friend of mine has uh, MS and uh, he, uh, I took him on the Nantahala and you know, it, things couldn't have happened more perfectly that day. About the third cast, throwing a streamer, he hooked a 34 and a quarter inch brown trout mm. that was the biggest trout I had ever seen in my mm. life and uh, we finally got finally got it landed and everything and I looked at Kelly and I go Kelly we're gonna put this one back right and he goes absolutely I would never kill a fish like this 
That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, that was really, really cool. That, you know, that was yeah. something that, that was one of those fish of 10,000 lifetimes. We've, so. uh, oh, yeah. we, we've all seen the picture, but where's a good spot where they could go see that fish? Because you've got a well, great photo of it. Well, you got one right here at the shop. Yeah. 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 And then I've got one at the shop as well. Yeah. So, so if you guys are in Bryson City, yeah. swing into his shop or ours and yeah. the picture's hanging up and... Yeah, it's, it's pretty a, it's, impressive. It's a it's a pretty funny picture too because Kelly is a, the, you know it looks totally look stunned. On his face. <laughs> yeah, he looks like he saw a ghost or something. All. But yeah. I mean, the tail on that fish looks like it's the size of your head. Like it's, yeah. it is. Yeah, the the girth on that fish. You know, we didn't we didn't measure the girth, but I'm guessing the girth to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 inches because yeah. it's a it's a big big heavy big heavy hen. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's massive. It's it's. You'll probably never catch another brown trout like that. No. I mean, no. it's very doubtful. I know, I know people that, that haven't caught a, a fish, no matter what kind, that's that yeah. big. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, that, it's pretty impressive. And to get it in in that kind of water, you know, Nantahala is always a challenge. You hook any yeah. kind of fish, you know. You, well, it just increases the weight. The, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those fish know how to use. Per square inch. You know, this, I figured out that those fish know how to use the water. They're, they're good. Yeah. It's like they know where the water grows and where all the rocks and sticks are. Well, you know? and they, like, also, they also know how to ferry. They'll go ahead and set their angle with their head away from you, and you are not pulling them in. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah, it's, so, it's actually pretty impressive. Yeah. So um, we're going to go kind of into the, I don't want to call it the elephant in the room because there's nothing between us about it, but it's kind of the elephant in our area about the what happened back in July last year on the Nantahala River. So just kind of set the scene for everybody. Hot Duke, topic, hot topic. Uh, Duke Energy um, is our power company in this area, and they have dams and we have tail races. And the Nantahala River is one of those tail races, at least part of the river is. So um, they had some some issues. What's the tail like, race, Bobby? <laughs> we'll we'll do that's at the end in the index. Um, so you know more about it than us, and the reason that we brought Ken in is to obviously learn more about him, but also to talk about this because this is a, a question we still get on a daily basis almost here in the shop. Um, we've gotten emails about it, phone calls about it. Um, Ken lives in the gorge in the Nantahala Gorge. He has a business in the Nantahala Gorge. He fly fishes in the Nantahala Gorge, and he rafts and kayaks in the Nantahala Gorge. So he's, he knows pretty much every side of it um, and probably has more hours on that river than just about anybody else in the world as far as fishing, for sure. So Ken, kind of go through what happened on the day that it all went down, and then we'll go through the consecutive days after that. All right. So, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, midsummer. We're talking about uh, the lake being pretty high and, you know, the water's been warmed up in the lake. And what happened is Duke Energy had a transmission problem at the power plant, which means essentially that they had to shut the generators down. Um, there's two things that go on when that happens, and especially at that time of the year because of the, the economic impact of the rafting, and, and it's not just the rafting, but also all of the businesses in the area. If you shut that water off, uh, everything pretty much goes dead here. And uh, so what they did is they, they released water from the lake, which was gonna be a warm water release. Now they had people monitoring that to try to make sure that we didn't have, you know, uh, too much of an impact on the aquatics. So, so just to clarify, for the the normal release for power generation comes off the bottom of the lake. Exactly. And exactly. so they were going to yeah, actually you, pull it you, off. It's piped top. over. and yeah. it Comes out of the powerhouse. Yeah. You know, normally, normally that water is coming out pretty low, and the reason that they do that obviously is as the lake drops, you want to have your outflow as low as possible in order to be able to continue generating. So, you know, normally, normally the Nantahala runs 48 degrees at the, at the point of where it comes out of the power plant, and it warms up to about 50, 52 degrees by the time you get down to the end of the river. The water um, off of the top of the lake was in somewhere around 65, 70 degrees. Um, not good water temperature for fish, obviously. Yeah. Um, they did that the first day and didn't see too much of an impact. But where the problem come in was by continuing to release that water, suddenly we started seeing some fish kill. And uh, there's a couple of things to, to take into consideration here. Number one, a lot of people don't realize that the Wildlife Commission had stocked 4,000 fish the day before. 
All right. Okay, so fresh stocked fish. Fresh stocked stressed. fish. Yeah, fresh stocked fish. Those fish are probably stressed already. Second of all, when they stock those fish uh, in the Nantahala, they will stock some brook trout in the Nantahala. And, and we all know that brook trout can't sustain the, the warmer uh, water temperatures as well as some of the other fish. There were, there were definitely um, all three species that had been, that were affected, but I suspect that the majority of those were the actual stocked fish. Okay. Now, there's going to be people that say, oh, no, I saw wild fish. You know, I saw this, I saw that. But, you know, the bottom line is that most of us, including guides, have a hard time telling a wild fish from a stocked fish. It's not like uh, what they do in some of the places where they'll cut the atavis fin. Here, yeah. they, here they don't do that. So, you know, it is really difficult. Now, that, that being said, um, Duke then tried to augment the water with colder water by doing a release off of Queens Creek. And at that point in time, they already knew they were going to have to shut the water off if they couldn't figure out a way of cooling that water down. Well, when they, when they opened up the floodgates, the, the gate at Queens Creek, the pipe, you know, to pipe the water down, all of a sudden here come a plug of mud. Okay, so that yeah. exasperated things even more. So they were scrambling, trying to figure out one way or another to go ahead and solve the problem while they shut the plant down. Um, about that time, they finally figured out what was going on and got the plant running. And that put a big boost of, of cold water into the Nantahala, and then things went on. The, the river itself, I have to say, is a, um, it's a pretty amazing river in the, in the sense that uh, the, the fish population that's in there, we have a, a really large fish population in there, a lot of wild fish. Yeah. That was one of the things that really surprised uh, Duke Energy when they did the FERCRI licensing back uh, a number of years ago. I sat in for 10 years in meetings going over how to, how to manage the stream. And the, uh, the, the, between the, the warm water release and then about two or three weeks later, three giant landslides coming into the river. Yeah. Yeah, we were gonna, uh, we're, I'm going to talk about that yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Anana Halo was getting hammered. Yeah, it had a rough summer, one, maybe. Oh, one yeah. thing after another, you know. But it's an incredibly resilient river because after, after they cleared things up enough so that we could get a boat down um, after the landslide event, I took uh, one of my clients who's one of the best uh, tightline Euro nymphers that I've ever had in the boat. And I called him up and I said, Bill, I need to know what's happened to the river. And so I'm, you know, I want you to just come. I'm going to give you a trip. I need a, I need a good fisherman in the boat while I'm rowing the boat. And, uh, and he came and we got down into the river there and right there below uh, uh, Patton's run, he hooked into about a 20 inch brown. And then we continued going downstream. And by the end of the day, we had a 70 fish day. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. you know, what that tells you, and, and as far as I can tell, again, it's, it is difficult. I mean, sometimes you know for sure you got a wild fish because you'll go ahead and pull one of those beautiful little browns or rainbows. Yeah, it's all that, colored up. Yeah, that you know they don't stock that small. Yeah. We caught, uh, you know, just about every fish that I saw there looked like it was uh, a wild fish. I mean, it was bright colored, good, healthy fish. Yeah. So... You know, the impact on the river, certainly there was an impact on the river. Are all the fish gone? Oh, no. no. You know, um, right after that, I had a, a young lad that um, we gave a trip to that was in the Big Brothers program. Mm -hmm. And he had never had a fly rod in his hand in his life. And I took him down, and we stopped right at the beginning. I showed him how to tight line nymph, and before it was done, we only did a half-day float. It was only a couple hours long, but he had caught 12 fish. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's pretty doggone good. Yeah, for somebody that's never for, done it. Yeah, 13-year-old yeah, kid that's never had a fly rod in his hand. I mean, yeah. you can't, you know. He was probably ecstatic. Oh, he was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy when I catch 13 fish. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy when I can fish. <laughs> yeah, just being out there. That's it, man. Yeah, so, uh, so for the time frame on this, 
month for the folks out there. This actually happened at the end of July. Yeah. Um, there. So, Ken, the Asheville Citizens Times published an article September 19, 2019, and I'm going to quote this, but I'm going to leave the names of the folks out yeah. just not to create any controversy. But, but it reads like this. In every eddy he searched, Blank found about a dozen mature rainbow trout dead or dying. Those still alive swam in dazed circles on the surface, wobbling like they'd received a blow to the head. The dead swirled in the eddies, their discolored bodies thumping against rocks until they were swept downstream or sank to the bottom. The next day, tourists rushed to buy fishing nets from Angler Blank at a river outfitter. They'd caught several stun trout in their bare hands, but figured they could haul more, haul away dozens of fish with nets. At the river's terminus at Lake Fontana, fishing guide Blank watched blue heron and osprey swoop down to feast on the unexpected windfall of dead and dying fish for the third day in a row. What were your observations during the same time frame, Man, that, Ken? That sounds like Exxon Valdez there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, not only that, but if they were quoting a, a fly fishing guide, I don't know any fly fishing guides that even begin to talk like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's way too elegant for us. Yeah, it is pretty. It's kind of that was pretty. Yeah, that's well written. Well, well. and, and that's the quote. Which no, you I know, I know, online. but yeah. I mean, I don't know of any. I don't know of any fly fishing guides that talk like that. So you know, <laughs> um, did they? Yeah, did they interview me? Yeah, they. They after the fact, after everything came out, they, they did interview me. And then I, I actually told them basically this, there were, there were fish that were definitely killed. Okay. I saw a few fish when I did the first trip down the river after the, the, uh, event. And I saw some fish on the bottom of the river. I didn't see many, but I did see a few, um, as to how many fish and what the impact was, that's impossible to say. Yeah. That's totally impossible to say. You know, a lot of people don't realize it, but the Wildlife Commission never even had done a shocking on the Nantahala until about three or four years ago. You know, all of the surveys prior to that were done off of creel surveys. And we're talking about a river that is considered to be one of the top 100 streams in the country. Um, frankly, I think more damage is done with the way that the river is being managed than what is going on with with what happened with this uh this you're saying water release. like the fishing regulations yeah the fishing managed. regulations well you know here's here's a classic you know I, I, we were joking before we started here and and it is true i i'm just a few years shy of being here for a half a century yeah okay when i got here in 1975 the fishing regulations on the Nantahala were seven fish any size any kind any type using any kind of bait do you know what the regulations are today? It's pretty much the same. Seven fish, <laughs> any size. Any, yeah. yeah, you know, we take a look at take a look at what's happened over the last number of years, last half century, and you'll find out. I mean, if you if you look at it, I mean, fishing has popularity has increased, the number of uh, or the equipment has has improved, techniques have improved. You know, we're we're talking about a river that's got a, a really good population of wild fish, but yet the the entity, the Wildlife Commission, in my and this is just my estimation, has done nothing to try to enhance or protect that yeah. that that's wild right. population. No, I, I agree. I there's think no it's, science behind it. it there's yeah. there's time for an update to regulations just because of the factor of number of anglers now. Oh yeah. Well, you know, and the and the thing is that you know they're as far as I can tell, their idea of managing a stream is putting stocked fish in. And, you know, when I said that 4,000 fish were put in, that's a lot of fish that, you know, if those 4,000, if all those 4,000 went ahead and died that they put in that river a day before this event happened, you'd see a bunch of fish in eddies swirling oh, yeah. around. You'd see yeah. the, you know, the sort of thing that, you know, that, you know, was reported. But, you know, at the same time, they say that 80% of those fish get caught out in the first two weeks. Yeah. Okay. That's that's pretty pretty amazing statistic right there. That's right. You know, I can't tell you how many times I I get up in the morning going and doing a, a trip, and I'll be driving either to the shop or, or driving upstream to see some guy walking down the stream with a twenty plus inch brown trout. Well, you know that's your good breeding stock. That's, that's right. your yeah. good genes for the for the river. And if we keep on jerking those fish out and killing them. 
which, you know, we all know they don't taste worth a darn. So, you know, all it is is, you know, just, a, you know, an ego trip That's to go right. ahead and keep a fish like that. You know, if you keep on pulling them out and they don't put a slot system in there sooner or later, all that's going to be in there are going to be small fish. Yeah. And, you know, right now there's probably a few too many small fish in there. So leave some of the big ones in there so that they can go ahead and eat the smaller yeah, ones. And, right. and we'll have even a better. Again, I'm not a biologist, but this is this is what I feel should happen. Yeah. You know, the other thing, the other thing, too, that's that's ironic when you think of this. All of us, any of us that have fished, any of us that have even watched a program on either trout or salmon know the fish, that species or type of fish will go upstream to spawn, mm -hmm. all right? Where is upstream on the Nantahala? Well, they go up into the delayed harvest stretch, mm -hmm. all right? And that's got a uniform flow of water, so it's not going up and down. It's a great place for them to spawn. You're not going to go ahead and and build a red and then have the water go out from underneath it or vice versa, you have the water too deep. And what do you have there? The entire winter, you got people tromping around in the stream and you've got people just tearing the God out of the fish. Yeah. So, you know, I, I for a long time, have felt that they should close down the delayed harvest on the upper Nantahala and put it above the the cascades running up the Junaluska road yeah. those fish will go all the way up to the cascades oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. so you know at that point in time you now have a decent place for the wild fish again to there's go ahead plenty and of reproduce. bridges to delineate that oh yeah demarcation. oh yeah i mean you know, you just go up to the cascades they can't swim any further upstream you want to yeah. go ahead and put in a mm -hmm. bunch of fish for folks to catch put them in above the cascades up yeah. the Junaluska road same length of river mm-hmm easier waiting yeah and you don't have people parking on a busy well highway. you know tennessee wildlife they've got that regulation on the south holston that you cannot yeah wade this time of year because of the reds well so. and, and yeah and in tennessee they actually manage streams yeah <laughs> you know? that's right they that's don't right. just put fish in they actually manage streams. yeah there's slot limits and yeah and various things going on over there i think that if they had a slot limit on the nantahala and 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 really you know, change some of the management practices. I think it would really help the Nantahala yeah. become even more of a, a world-class river than it is now. You know, the other thing too, if you think about it, I mean, we all we all guide and we're all out here on our delayed harvest streams, and you know, the regulations are single hook artificial. You got to put the fish back. All right, that, that last statement, putting the fish back, but yet you can use a you can use a barbed hook. Mm -hmm. Uh, that makes no sense. Yeah, I think pretty, <laughs> pretty much most of us in this room use barbless or we yeah. debarb yeah. Yeah. before yeah. we even cast. A absolutely. You know, and the, and the ironic thing is you don't need a barb anyway. I think you, you hook up better with a barbless you hook do. than oh, you, you do, do with a barbed yeah. hook. And yeah. at least now you're not going ahead and taking fish that are already stressed, especially in the early part of the season when they first stock for the delayed harvest. You're not taking fish that are already stressed and then stressing them even more. Yeah, That's right. That's definitely so, something to keep yeah. pushing for and see if see if anything happens. You never yeah. know. But. Yeah. So you, you touched on the landslide that happened in August, which happened right after the, the Generation House event too. So as far as like the river itself, you, you said as far as you can tell, it's still fishing yeah. like it did before. But did it change with the landslide, like the actual flow of the river? I know they cleaned it out, but. The flow, the flow is going to be the same, okay? Mm -hmm. But they have to put out, uh, they put out, what is it maybe 550 600 cfs something like that out of the power plant they can vary that about 100 cfs one way or the other when they put a different runner in the power plant years ago and and uh so they can you know it's boosted up a little bit higher actually than what it used to run uh what it used to typically run mm -hmm. um insofar as what the landslides did really um there's a couple of places where it's a little bit different but yeah, it changed a little bit of the hydrology in a few places. Just a, yeah, just a, I could tell just some nuances rolling. Yeah, in. yeah. There's you know there's one or two places where the you know all of a sudden there's a rock there that you hadn't seen before. But other than that, it's really pretty similar. Probably the biggest change is when you get down below Quarry Rapid. You know now you're moving over. You know typically moving over to uh, the left side of a little island where normal you know in the past you would never go over there. Mm -hmm. The biggest. <laughs> The biggest change is you you better get your fly tying equipment out because 
<laughs> you get down in that area where those landslides are, you're going to be hooking some monster, oh, yeah. monster wood. Yeah, I can imagine <laughs> using some jigs. Some, there's some yep. deadfall still yeah, stuck in if there. Yeah, if you're nymph fishing in there, you're going to go ahead and lose some fit, yeah. lose some flies in there. So. It, it's amazing to, to be on the river and look up the chute. Yeah. And just to see the the... I mean, it is sheer rock all the way to, from the top of the mountain all the way down. It's all amazing how down. much material was displaced. So, so for somebody who's never possibly fished the river, in kind of like your your words, what would be the typical day on a? It's going to be a two part question because you've got the upper section which is above the power plant, which is the delayed harvest, and then you've got the hatchery section which is below the power plant, which is what we float. So kind of what do you see in a, a, a day of waiting up on that upper and then a, a float on the bottom? Like what can they expect? Style of fishing, flies, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, You know, the, the upper part is typical delayed harvest. Um, you know, the, the one thing that the Nantahala has that's really sort of cool is in the uh, delayed harvest stretch, um, pretty much all day long, but certainly toward dusk, you get a lot of dry fly activity. And... You know, you won't see that much of it. You can still see a little bit of it on the, on the uh, tail race of the Nantahala, but not as much. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is, it's sort of funny, when we were doing the relicensing for the Nantahala, Nantahala Lake is almost sterile. It's that clean. In fact, the joke was that they needed to go ahead and do some straight piping in there, get some, <laughs> get some, <laughs> oh my gosh, get wow. some nutrients in there, oh, get some nu- get some nutrients in there, so we can get some entomology going <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, on the upper, you know, streamers, the same thing as as you would expect on any of the delayed harvest streams. Uh, typically, it's a little bit easier fishing. Those fish are used to you know gobbling up just about anything, but. Um, yeah, you know, woolly boogers, you know, you can't beat a woolly booger. Yeah. So, you know, those work pretty well. Uh, you know, some small nymphs, you you know, you just have to sort of look and, and get an idea when they stocked because when they first stock, they'll eat pretty much anything. You can use fish, you know, imitation egg patterns or, or whatever. But, you know, later on, those fish actually do start getting a little more wise. Yeah. And, yeah. and revert back to, you know, I don't know their normal uh, environment and they're going to be looking around and you know that's when those blue wing olives start coming out and you know during the during springtime good lord there's every conceivable type of dry fly you could think of that'll hatch up yeah. up there yeah. on the on the lower nanahala you know really the two best ways that i have found when we're at least when we're doing the float trips is uh dead drifting nymphs um and I'm not a big fan of strike indicators. Uh, like to Euro nymph there, and the reason being that you've got a you got a bottom there that can go anywhere from a few inches deep all the way down to about eight ten feet deep, and it can change drastically in a very very short period of time. So to put a strike indicator on, you know either you're going to be dragging the nymph through the shallow water, or the nymph isn't even going to be on the bottom in mm-hmm. deeper water. So you know the Euro nymphing seems to work out really well. I haven't had, I actually, as long as I've been, let's see, probably in the last 10 years, I bet I can count on one hand the time that I've had a strike indicator on yeah. for, for guests in yeah. the boat. You know, I teach them how to Euro nymph right out of the bucket. Um, you know, if you're after, uh, after one of the bigger brown trout, you got to get out there when the water is a little bit dingy and realize that you're resorting back to what i used to call musky fishing you know fish of ten thousand casts yep yeah you're gonna go ahead and throw some big streamers that uh that big trout that i was talking about earlier that kelly caught that was caught on a game changer that was on a big you know four inch streamer now on the flip side though a lot of people say well you can't catch a big brown unless you are using streamers and well that's not well, true yeah, either that's right. completely false yeah. that's completely false i've i've caught fish in the 20 you know upper 20s to low 30 inch range with, off of uh, nymphs before there too so you know it's just you know if you get it in front of them and they're hungry they're going to take it they're always yeah. eating yeah 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 i mean they've got to yeah. so um i mean i've i've we floated the river with you i mean I've seen us fish streamers, nymphs, and dry flies all in the same day. Yeah. Like, it, it just happens, you know? So, it's it's one yeah. of those rivers where you might see it and go, hey. So, it's a good idea to bring, bring all everything. your rods. Yeah. yeah. Bring you everything. Just, <laughs> you might just need it. 
um, you start seeing those blue wing olives come off and you're like, let's start throwing dries, you know? I'll tell you what, there's nothing more fun than going ahead and throwing dries in that fast water. Yeah. You really, you really have to, it's a challenge in casting. You know, I, it's sort of funny. I, one of the things I'll teach people when we go out on a trip almost right away, if there's a spot where you almost can catch some fish on a dry fly. And it's in one of those unique spots where you got an eddy and you got fast water coming right off the edge of that eddy. And I'll tell them, all right, you got to do a curve cast there. And you get this pause and dead silence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they'll look at you and go, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah curve cast. You got to do a curve cast. You know, and, and, and that really, you know, probably a tuck cast for the nymphing and curve casts mm-hmm. are really important on the Nantahala because yeah. we got such sharp eddy lines where you got that faster moving water. We're not talking about a lazy stream. Yeah, and you've got, you've, you almost have to like fish ahead. And what I mean by that is, yeah. is you got to plan your next cast while you're picking up. Yeah. Because it's, that water's moving at a pretty good clip when you're in that boat. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, you know, a, a friend of mine that the guides for us, Bob Grenant, you guys yeah, know him, yeah. you know, and Bob always looks at the people and sort of smiles at them and, you know, just about ready to wink at them going, well, I can tell you the Nantahala is combat fishing. And they'll, they'll look and they'll go, why? Because all the other people out there? Nope. <laughs> because everything's happening real fast. Yeah, it does. It happens very quick. <laughs> yeah. You can't bring, bring your rod high at all. No, no. You don't. If you go ahead and do an overhead cast, then you're going to be tying on a lot of flies. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and you know. It's don't put more, your hands in the trees. No, so, no. <laughs> yeah. So one thing we get asked a lot in the shop, and, you know, we usually steer people away from doing this, um, is waiting the lower when they are generating. <laughs> Kind of what's your opinion on that, you know, especially for somebody that doesn't know the river? So. Yeah. You actually, you actually have to be pretty careful. I mean, there are some places where you can wade, but you, you really need to know the river. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing how you can get into two or three foot of water and have your feet go out from underneath and, and yeah. yell it because that water is moving so fast. Yeah. So, you know... It is not it is not a place for the unwary to be out there. And, you know, the other thing, too, that makes it even more um, more dangerous on the wading end is because that water is so cold, most people are wearing waders. Well, if you go in with the waders, you got a giant balloon there that, you know, that can cause some problems. Oh, yeah. But, you know, there are there are a few places. There's some places where it slows down and it's just a matter of knowing where they are. And then, uh, you know, go from there. So know your limitations. Be smart. Now, yeah. the upper the upper is fine as long as they're yeah. not doing a special release for uh, a whitewater weekend. Yeah. But the lower, you really got to know know what you're doing. So be smart. Know your limitations. Um, and if you do go waiting, it's always a good good thing to take a buddy just oh, in case is. something does happen. Absolutely. So, so just be smart with that. Well, we'll kind of end this, man, with, with uh, one of our last questions that we ask everybody. If you do, what's your favorite bourbon? <laughs> if you have you know one. you know it, it's funny because you know i'd rather drink bourbon than drink just about anything else but <laughs> you know probably the thing the thing that i'll that i'll have a little little glass of just about every night is a little bit of wild turkey honey there wild turkey honey there we go yeah. i gotta try that one there i haven't had well, yeah. Nope. yeah that's uh you know it I'm not I'm not into the real real harsh stuff, you know, and not yeah. into a lot like of hot it. Hot bourbon. Yeah, not into I'll, a little like not into bourbon. a lot of it, but I I do like the, you know, just a little bit of that splash of wild turkey honey at the end of the day and you know, it's sort of like dessert. That's fantastic, oh, yeah. man. That's awesome. Fantastic. That's cool. Well, um just give uh give everybody a way to contact you phone number, website, whatever you want them to go to, kind of. Yeah, the you know, the best way the best way to contact is um I give them an 800 number, 800-224-7238. And uh, if you want to look at the website, uh, the website's sort of complicated because it covers everything, the fishing, the rafting, the whole nine yards. But it's www.endlessriveradventures.com. Cool. One, of the, one of the cool things with us is I know that sometimes it's hard to get a haul pass to go out and fish, but... If you go ahead and stop by, we can go ahead and figure out things for the rest of the family. They won't even they won't even know you're gone. That's right. Yeah. So and I mean whitewater rafting, man, it's 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 fun. So yeah. if you've got some youngsters that are of age, definitely take them because on the Nanahale you have to be a is it a certain age or certain weight? It's both. It's se- it's either sixty pounds or seven years okay. old. Is so yeah, you know that's something fun for the whole family to do and 
most of the kids, I think, probably like look at those kayaks and get excited. Oh, they so, do. Yeah. They do. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, Julia, my wife, runs. Uh, you know, we do clinics or private instruction all year long, and then we'll do some kids clinics. And uh, the kids clinics every year fill up right away. And in fact, we've already opened up several extra ones this year. So you know, the kids get out there, and parents, uh, you know it's sort of fun it's something that they can do together and it isn't long before the kids are taking care of the parents yeah yeah so. start them young that's yeah. awesome man yeah well we appreciate you doing the podcast man and hanging out with us for a little bit and you know educating some people on some stuff that that you know better than we do so we really appreciate you coming out and yeah, yeah it's always nice uh we we kind of at least me and dale um from the time we started the business we somewhat see you and and actually bob granant which you mentioned kind of as a little bit of mentors so we appreciate oh, yeah. that man yeah i appreciate guys, the, i appreciate the sentiment you know it's always road. it's always it's always fun to, to come in here and chit chat with you yeah, guys yeah. and it's uh, even more fun when i can go ahead and drag you out of this That's place right. and get yeah. you fish it's just hard to do sometimes <laughs> very hard to do well if anybody out there's got questions about ken or need info for him or us you can contact us 828-488-3333 Website for us is www.tuckflyshop.com. We appreciate y'all listening today. And uh, tune in next week. I'm not sure what's on par. I think it's another top ten we might be doing. So feel free to listen into this one and that one. Thank you, guys.